I'm Cindy Kelly in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and it's December 7, 2017, and I have with me John Hunter. And the first question for John is to say his name and spell it. My name is John Hunter, J-O-N-H-U-N-N-E-R. John, just to get some station identification, why don't you tell people uh, who you are and, and uh, what you've been doing uh, professionally on for the last 30 years. Okay. Uh, currently, I'm a professor of history in, in New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, and I, uh, I've written two books about uh, atomic matters. One, a social and cultural history of Los Alamos called Inventing Los Alamos, and then a biography of, of Oppenheimer called J. Robert Oppenheimer, The Cold War and the Atomic West. So I've been working in atomic matters you know, for oh, 25, 30 years. So that makes you well qualified for... <laughs> well, and, and I come from an atomic family. My father administered nuclear weapons for the Air Force. So, uh, so we had uh, photographs of above-ground nuclear blasts on our family room wall. So while watching Lost in Space, <laughs> there was Trinity right there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, um, so it's a little more than 30 years. <laughs> I guess so. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. That's wonderful. We're interested in trying to trace the trail of those who worked on the Manhattan Project from their first arrival at Lamy train station um, to uh, Los Alamos and um, where the Manhattan Project took place in New mm -hmm. Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, why don't we start um, talking about Lamy and, and okay. what that was. Okay. Uh, Lamy is the closest station to Santa Fe on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. So imagine these scientists and their families coming from the East Coast, coming from the Midwest, coming from California, and arriving at a very small station. Um, they were met by, uh, by Army staff cars and, and uh, people who said, you know, Dr. So-and-so, come this way. Um, and most of the scientific personnel knew what they were doing, but their families didn't. So there was a lot of confusion. People came into this place thinking they were going to go to this top secret laboratory, and it's this little station in the middle of nowhere. And they're met, they're put in staff cars, and then they're taken into Santa Fe. And again, some confusion. Oh, Santa Fe, this is a nice place, because they weren't told where they were, where their ultimate destination was. So they thought, oh, Santa Fe's kind of nice, and then they got to 109 East Palace, and Dorothy McKibben said, eh, it's not here either, it's still a little far away, here's your top secret pass to get you in the gate, you have to drive another 40 miles. Because some of the top scientists were in code names, the the army people who were to meet them were walking up and down the platform saying their code names. And, uh, and so um, Niels Bohr was Nicholas Baker. And so sometimes somebody would be calling out a name and the wife wouldn't know that was a code name for her husband. So there was still even more confusion kind of saying, well, who's going to meet us? Well, are you with Nicholas Baker? It's like, no. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of confusion there. There were three spies that we know of that operated in Los Alamos. Um, of course, the most famous is Klaus Fuchs who was a German physicist who fled Nazi Germany, then worked, went and worked in, in Britain and was part of the British mission. When he was in Germany, he was a Communist Party member, pretty active, but then when he left, um, the, the, his contacts with the Communist Party said, don't do anything with the Communist Party in Britain. So he was a deep cover agent. He didn't do anything that um, let the British know that he was a Communist Party member. Um, and then he was sent over to Los Alamos as part of the British mission. And he then worked on um, the, uh, um, the atomic bomb. Uh, he was a physicist, so he knew what was going on. He was very good at, at kind of, he was an integral in that. Um, and then in the spring of 1945, uh, a Soviet agent from New York called Harry Gold came to New Mexico and made contact with two of the three spies. Uh, he made contact with Klaus Fuchs, 
in Santa Fe, not in Los Alamos. Klaus Fuchs had a car, and uh, so he drove into Santa Fe, picked up Harry Gold, and then went to the Castillo Bridge. And I'm not sure if the Castillo Bridge is still there. Somewhere on that east side of, uh, of downtown Santa Fe is where this exchange then was made. Klaus Fuchs opened up his briefcase, took out the plans for the, for the fat man bomb, gave them to Harry Gold, who then took them and uh, eventually went back to New York, which they were put in a diplomatic pouch and sent to the Soviet Union. That was the most damaging um, information that was leaked out of Los Alamos and actually was the blueprint for the first Soviet bomb that detonated in 1949. Other Soviet bombs then developed their own designs, but that first one was blueprint Los Alamos, courtesy of Klaus Fuchs. So there's another, there's another man that uh, Harry Gold got in touch with uh, by the name of David Greenglass. And he was uh, not a scientist. He worked in the laboratory that shaped the explosive lenses for the Fat Man Bomb. What he gave Harry Gold were these kind of crude drawings of the design for the implosion bomb of just the explosive lenses. Um, and he was at his wife's house in Albuquerque at the time when Harry Gold showed up. They had these, this box of jello that was cut a certain way. They put the two halves together and that then identified that they could talk to each other. And so then uh, Greenglass gave these plans to Harry Gold. He took them back with Fuchs's uh, uh, blueprint and, uh, and sent them off to the Soviet, um, the, to the Soviet Union. The third spy that was operating in Los Alamos at the time was this American called Ted Hall. He was a, a, a graduate student and a, a physicist, um, and he wasn't a Communist Party member. He didn't have any connections with the Soviet Union, but he didn't think it was right for one country to have a monopoly of such a powerful weapon. So in one of his leaves from Los Alamos, he went into the Soviet consulate in New York City and started talking about the work that he did in Los Alamos. Those are the three spies that we know about. There's some rumors that there might have been a, th a fourth spy, uh, but, but it's, uh, I don't really know a whole lot about that. Was, Op was Oppenheimer a spy? I don't think so. Um, but there's some puzzling things in the Verona uh, uh, transmissions that were coded to the Soviet Union. Um, there's some, some transmissions that say something about a high-placed person in, in Los Alamos in the Manhattan Project. Um, the KGB has not opened up the Oppenheimer file. The, old, the defunct KGB has not opened up the, uh, the Oppenheimer file, so we don't know what's in it. But um, uh, did he have communist uh, associations? Absolutely. His wife was a Communist Party member, Kitty Oppenheimer. Uh, and her uh, second husband actually was a Communist Party organizer in Ohio and died on the fields in Spain uh, during the Spanish Civil War uh, as a communist. Uh, Oppenheimer's brother and sister-in-law were also Communist Party members. Some of his best friends in Berkeley before the war were Communist Party members. So again, it's a little bit troubling that Oppenheimer had such close ties to Communist Party members, including several people that were in his family. But in the long run, I don't think he was a spy. That's good. Oh, there's one question. People, this appears to be maybe more fa uh, fiction than fact, but they talk about the drugstore um, mm -hmm. that was in off the plaza mm -hmm. in Santa Fe as, as, a, as a place associated with espionage somehow. So there were several uh, drugstores in downtown Santa Fe uh, uh, during the Manhattan Project, and one of them is rumored to be um, a, a place where um, some of the operations of the Soviet agents went, went b before the Manhattan Project. Um, supposedly, uh, that drugstore was where um, uh, it was planned for the assassination of, uh, of Leon Trotsky down in Mexico. So it was mounted after, out of this drugstore in Santa Fe, and then the agents went into Mexico and, uh, and assassinated Trotsky. Um, I, it's 
I'm not quite sure where it is. There's several, just because there's several locations that could have been this, this uh, deep cover Soviet uh, agent or Soviet uh, place. Um, but if one of them is right, it's right across from 109 East Palace. So if they wanted to watch who was going in and out of 109 East Palace, all they had to do was look out their window. So this drugstore, um, if it's true, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, it's, if it had anything to do with the Manhattan Project and spying on the Manhattan Project. It didn't have anything to do with Harry Gold as much as I can tell. But this drugstore before the war was run by, um, by Soviet agents. And, uh, and even though it was a drugstore, it was also this cover, a legitimate cover, for the uh, uh, undercover work that Soviet agents were doing in the United States and as well as, as in Mexico. Another uh, sort of point of reference, a uh, place where uh, associated with the Manhattan Project that, that has gotten some, some uh, publicity in a very positive way is the house at Ottawa Bridge. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about Edith Warner and who she was. And... Yeah. So uh, new arrivals coming from Lamy, if they came in by train or coming by car through Santa Fe and 109 East Palace, then were told to uh, cross the Rio Grande uh, at, at the Ottawa Bridge. And at, right across the Ottawa Bridge was this little adobe house um, and a wonderful woman by the name of Edith Warner lived there. Now, Edith Warner in the 1920s had come from the Midwest um, for health reasons. And, and the house itself is on the San Ildefonso Indian Pueblo Reservation. Um, and so she lived kind of on, on a corner of that. Uh, and, and she thought, she, I mean, she lived there for a long time. She thought she was in heaven. She wanted to get away from kind of modern America in the 1920s and 30s. Um, she raised her son there. Um, she had close, close friends uh, with the San Ildefonso Pueblans, um, and and, um, and and she uh, uh, she did some things for the tribe. The railroad at the time went through there, so she was kind of a mail agent, and the railroad would stop there and give her packages for the pueblo. Um, and then uh, one day in 1942. Uh, a man that she had known because he had come by on his trips up into the mountains, the Hamas Mountains, came by and said, your life's going to change. Uh, and, and this man was Robert Oppenheimer. He had stopped there because he loved going to the mountains of New Mexico and the Hamas Mountains were attractive to him and when he would ride horses out into the wilderness. Uh, and so he stopped and warned her that, that there was going to be a change in, in what happened in this sleepy little, little part of, uh, of New Mexico. And so sure enough, it did happen. Um, she then started seeing convoys and buses going up the hill to Los Alamos. Um, she eventually put together a little tea house in one of the adobe buildings, and it was a place where people could come off the hill without getting uh, a pass to go into Santa Fe. So they could, it was kind of considered in, in Los Alamos, so people could come down, they could have dinner at her tea house or have tea, and her chocolate cake was, was, uh, was well known. Um, I've never had a recipe of it, but it was, by all, all accounts, was very delicious and, and renowned, and people uh, got the recipe and took it back and made it for, uh, for themselves. Um, and, and so here was this woman who was looking for isolation and away from modern America, and the future America all of a sudden came knocking at her door. Do you want to say anything about Dorothy McKibben? Dorothy McKibben... Uh, had been living in Santa Fe for a while, and she was approached to work with the Manhattan Project, to, to be kind of the gatekeeper in Santa Fe. As people arrived in Santa Fe, she was the one who would issue them temporary top secret passes, show them where they needed to, to go or arrange for transportation from Santa Fe to Los Alamos. Um, but she wasn't quite sure she wanted to do that. Uh, and she was then taken to the lobby of La Fonda Hotel right on the plaza of Santa Fe. And in that lobby met Robert Oppenheimer. And, and she looked at him and, and saw him and immediately said, I want to work for this man. Uh, and, you know, I'm asked part of his charisma. 
uh, she said I immediately want to work for him and so uh, so she signed up and she then uh, operated out of 109 East Palace um, at the time there were more buses coming in out of 109 East Palace than the regular bus stop on the other side of the plaza uh, so during the Manhattan Project there were buses coming in and out from Los Alamos all the time um, she also was a place where people coming down from the hill uh, would 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 go to 109 East Palace, they would buy something, leave it at 109 East Palace until they went back up the, to the hill. Um, she sponsored weddings at her house from people who met in Los Alamos. Um, so she was in a way this kind of nurturing person for, uh, for a lot of the people in Los Alamos. Great. Uh, maybe you can talk about um, the La Fonda uh, hotel and, and bar and, and kind of what it meant for the scientists yeah. and for the mice. La, La Fonda is, a, is an institution in itself in Santa Fe. It was first built right after World War I in this new architectural style called Spanish Pueblo Revival that's, that's now somewhat, somewhat renowned as this Santa Fe style. Um, and it was a place where a lot of people went to, where um, it was right on the plaza, it was, the hospitality was fantastic, um, and it had a bar. And people from Los Alamos who came down to Santa Fe uh, oftentimes would go to the bar and would dance and have cocktails, would have a, a steak dinner. Actually, uh, after Oppenheimer and General Leslie Groves looked at the site at Los Alamos to try to find out where they were going to put this laboratory, they had a steak dinner at La Fonda. To, and that's where they said, Los Alamos is the place for this central laboratory. So there's a lot of history in, in La Fonda connected to Los Alamos. Now, because the Army said to the FBI, you will have no agents in Los Alamos, they didn't. But they were very interested, the FBI was very interested in what was going on in Los Alamos. So they stationed a couple of their agents as bartenders in, in La Fonda to see if anybody would, uh, would, would, would spill the beans about what they were doing. Um, and supposedly, to my understanding, nobody spilled the beans. Um, and, and, uh, and, and there were a lot of rumors about what Los Alamos was. Uh, because across the valley, 40, 50 miles away, all of a sudden where there were no lights, all of a sudden lights started appearing at night, uh, where, you know, light up Los Alamos. And so rumors uh, were, went around Santa Fe. One rumor was that Los Alamos was a place that was making windshield wipers for submarines. The second rumor was that Los Alamos was a place for pregnant wax. Now, that seems somewhat fanciful until you realize that there was a baby boom in Los Alamos at the time, and then those pregnant women from Los Alamos would come into Santa Fe, and it was obvious they weren't from Santa Fe. Uh, so there was all these kind of different people walking around Santa Fe who were pregnant. So maybe it was a pregnant place for wax. Um, I think one of the most favorite ones, at least for the Los Alamos or the Santa Fe people, is that uh, Los Alamos was a place where they built the front end of donkeys and sent them to Washington, D.C. for final assembly. That's great. That's great. Oh, um, that's great. I have another story to go okay. along with that. Uh, because, um, because Oppenheimer convinced Groves to allow the scientists to bring their families with him. Because otherwise he said, scientists won't come if they don't bring their families. And even though this was an army post, and unusual for an army post for civilians to bring their families with them, Groves allowed it. Um, so, and these were a lot of young, young couples. Um, and young couples do what young couples do, and all of a sudden there was a baby boom at the maternity ward in, in Los Alamos. Groves wasn't too happy about that. He thought that took away from the mission, at least of the hospital. Um, now they had to have, you know, had to have pediatrics and they had to have childbirths and all of that. And so one of his visits, at one of his visits in Los Alamos, he took Oppenheimer aside and said, you have to do something about this baby boom. 
And Oppenheimer demurred, partly because Kitty was pregnant at the time, uh, and he said it wasn't the job of a civilian director to get involved in the private lives of the people that worked for him. But a limerick swept through the community, and it goes like this. The general's in a stew. He trusted you and you. He thought you'd be scientific. Instead, you're, instead you're just prolific. And what is he to do? That's cute. Very cute. Um, what about the main gate? That's that's kind of an icon. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell talk about the function and how the security uh, Los Alamos had? Yeah. So uh, so the, the the community of Los Alamos is on top of of a plateau, with very steep canyons on on three of the sides and the and the and the fourth side's connected to the Hamas Mountains. So it's like this finger that comes out of the Hamas Mountain, and at the tip of that finger is is a the main gate. You have to come up a treacherous road, especially back then, uh, to get to the top of the plateau, and then you were stopped at the gate, and you couldn't get in unless you had a top secret security pass. And even children had to have some kind of security pass to get in. Even four and five year olds had to have that security pass. Um, it was, it was uh, defended with tanks. Um, there, were, there was a big watchtower with a bright light on it. Um, and, and so it was very tightly controlled. There was only one other way officially to get into Los Alamos and that was at um, the other side on the, uh, at the side where the finger attaches to the mountain, to the Amos Mountains. And that was another gate, but it wasn't that, it wasn't used that much. Um, so mo- people came in and out the main gate. Um, there is a great story about Richard Feynman who uh, was kind of, to me, a jokester figure there, although very talented, uh, a physicist. I mean, he had just finished his graduate students at, at Princeton, uh, graduate studies at Princeton uh, when he came to Los Alamos. And, um, and he chafed at the security for a lot of different reasons. But one of the things he did is he would find gaps in the fence and he would go out the main gate and he would sign out and then he would sneak around and get back in through the gap in the fence um, and not sign back in. And then he'd go back out again. So there was all these times where he was going out, but no times where he was coming back in. Uh, and and security, the security personnel didn't like that too much. That's good. Um, let's see here. So then we go to the northern Rio Grande communities um, mm-hmm. that were you know, in the shadow of Los Alamos. And can you talk about their role in the Manhattan Project Mm -hmm. or reaction to it? Mm -hmm. When most people think of Los Alamos, they think of the scientists who work there. Some of them Nobel Prize winners, future Nobel Prize winners. Some of the smartest scientists in the world worked at Los Alamos. But there were other people who made the community go. And one of the key um, people, one of the, the key communities that uh, supported Los Alamos were the people from the valley, from the Española Valley. Um, and those people were Native Americans. Those people were Hispanics whose families sometimes had been in the valley for generations, maybe even centuries. Um, and they would then get on buses every morning and go up the hill and they did a variety of, of, uh, of work up there. Some of them were carpenters who helped build the buildings. Some of them were bus drivers, truck drivers, electricians. Um, women from San Altefonso Pueblo uh, were uh, housekeepers and would be assigned to go into different houses and, and help uh, women, especially who had a lot of children, with their housekeeping duties. Um, there were some people who worked in the commissary Bences Gonzalez is a good example of that. He had been at Los Alamos uh, working for the boys' school before it became part of the Manhattan Project. Then he stayed on and worked in the commissary and was able to get fresh fruits and vegetables for them. And also to advocate for the Hispanics who were in Los Alamos. Um, So there were some housing issues where uh, Hispanic families were, were given less housing than, than other people, and, and Bense Gonzalez then started being the mouthpiece and the spokesperson for them. And, and eventually, after threatening to go to Congress about, about the unequal treatment, um, Hispanic families started getting bigger houses. 
Um, so, so there was a lot of dynamics, and some people say it was like a like a mini United Nations, and that's not just because of the uh, immigre scientists from Europe who were working there. It was also because of the people uh, from different ethnic groups nearby, from uh, from the Española Valley, from the nearby pueblos, who also worked there. After the atomic bomb went off, and it became known what Los Alamos was about. Um, the Pueblo of San Altafonso invited some of the people that uh, the Puebla people had been working for up on the hill to come down to the community center in San Altafonso and have a dance, a celebration. And so um, there was this combination of the Scientific Hill people and some of their family and then the Pueblans. And um, they did different dances. Uh, the people from Los Alamos did square dances, uh, which which the Native Americans joined in on. Native Americans did a serpent dance um, and kind of wound through there, and Los Alamos people joined in on that. At one point, um, there were some drummers drumming their Indian drums, and the um, governor of San Altafonso, in tune with the drumming, jumped up on the table and said, this is the atomic age. This is the atomic age. And this is as people were dancing and, and celebrating. There's a wonderful photograph of the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi talking to the famed uh, uh, Native American potter Maria Martinez. And so they're talking to each other at that, at that dance. And right next to Maria Martinez is one of her sons, Popa Vidai, who worked as a scientist up at Los Alamos. Um, and he's holding a, a, his child, and they're talking with Enrico Fermi. So the Manhattan Project took over Los Alamos Boys Ranch, where uh, people, industrialists from the Midwest and the East Coast, sent their, uh, their young boys and, and young men as kind of a way to toughen them up, almost in the Teddy Roosevelt style of, of go west and, and become a man. Uh, and, and, and the Boys Ranch was, was tough. It was, yeah, you wore shorts all year round. And this is up at 7,000 feet above sea level in the mountains, so it gets cold in the winter. Uh, they, slept out, you know, they slept in screened-in sleeping porches during the winter. Um, so this was not an easy place to, to go to school. Uh, when the Manhattan Project came in, they, they took over the existing buildings of the Boys Ranch. Uh, and and uh, the bathtub row was one of, those, one of those places where the headmaster had his, his house and some of the the, the teachers had their houses there on Bathtub Row. Uh, during the Manhattan Project, it was the only place in Los Alamos that had bathtubs. So, uh, so when the families, when Oppenheimer and Kitty went out in the evening, uh, Wax would want to babysit there, and they'd take care of the children and then put them to bed, and then the rumor goes that they took baths because it was the only place to take a bath. Um, so, uh, so Bathtub Row was, is still there today, and the Oppenheimer House is now actually owned by the Los Alamos uh, Historical Society, uh, and, and it's going to be part of their, uh, uh, of their interpretation of the Manhattan Project. Robert Oppenheimer Oppie and his wife Kitty were pretty complex people, and even historians who have studied them for a long time come away thinking they're enigmas. Uh, they, um, they do things that you scratch your head and say, why did they do that? Um, uh, now granted, Oppenheimer w was a genius. Um, he, uh, he had an incredible memory. Uh, he was gifted in, in, in languages. Uh, he knew seven languages. Um, uh, at one point he taught himself Sanskrit because he wanted to read the, the holy books of, of Hinduism. Um, the Bhagavad Gita in particular. Um, he, uh, when he was a young boy, he got fascinated with rocks. And so, um, so he wrote a letter to the New York Geological Society uh, saying something about rocks, and they said, oh, would you like to come and talk to us, to our, to our meeting? And so he showed up, this you know, young, young, young teenager, with his father. And they thought his father was going to be the speaker and were surprised when, when this young boy actually gave, gave the talk. Um, so he was, he was gifted intellectually, uh, maybe not so much socially. Um, he, he was char charismatic. When you talked with him, he was the type of person that 
put his full attention on the conversation so that when you came away, you thought, wow, he really got what I was saying. We had a wonderful exchange. We kind of had a mind meld. Um, so he, was, he had that type of, of personality. But also, he uh, didn't suffer uh, fools uh, easily. Uh, and he could be very sharp in his criticism of people. And he also could say something that was totally inappropriate. And one famous uh, example of this is after the war, he was talking to President Truman, who had given the order to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. And an Oppenheimer said, you know, President, I feel I have blood on my hands. And, and President Truman, who really gave the order, uh, said, well, don't worry about the future of atomic weapons. We'll take care of it, and pretty quickly dismissed him and then turned to his aide and said, I never want to see that son of a bitch in this office again. So, so he, he didn't quite have a facility to read people very well at times. At other times, he, you know, he, people came away saying, this, this man's a genius, and, um, but at other times he would say inappropriate things. Okay, tell us about Kitty. Kitty's a delicate subject. Um, uh, Oppenheimer was her fourth husband. Uh, her first husband was a musician who was a drug addict. Her second husband was a Communist Party member who died in the Spanish Civil War fighting the fascists. Um, her third husband was uh, from uh, uh, Caltech down in Pasadena, and that was a very short marriage because she met Oppenheimer. He had a, he had a partial assignment to teach at Caltech. Um, and when they met, it was one of those just instant love, at, you know, just instant love. And, and they got together, and, um, and she divorced uh, her third husband, and then, um, and then they were together the rest of their lives and had two children. Um, she was a Communist Party member. Uh, her, she helped her second husband, um, Joe Dallet, with his uh, organizing activities in Ohio, and... Um, and then uh, was on her way to meet him in Spain when, in Paris, she got word that he had been killed on the battlefield. Um, and that, as you can imagine, threw her for a loop um, and, and devastated her. Um, so when she and Oppie got together, uh, and this was Oppie's first and only wife, um, they got together, they had a child very quickly, uh, Peter. Um, and uh, they uh, um, lived in Berkeley, um, had a collection of uh, friends, most of them who were left-leaning, if not Communist Party members. Um, and, uh, and, and in the 30s, um, lived this, this life of, uh, of being in Berkeley, being in, in Pasadena, with his teaching, going to uh, the, their cabin in the Pecos Mountains, uh, uh, north of, in the mountains outside of Santa Fe during the summer to recover from this this hectic lifestyle, um, and then when Oppenheimer was chosen by Groves to become director of the of the laboratory, um, she went along. But I think she went along somewhat grudgingly, because she was never uh, a director's wife that entertained that that was a social person who who helped him. With, uh, uh, with the mission of, of keeping all of these different people together, some of them with very big egos, um, but, and also under a, a pressure cooker, um, you know, a pressure cooker in a top secret community, surrounded by fences and guards, um, with the war going on, um, with, you know, with, with some relatives dying overseas, uh, with some of the guards, the MPs that were there, coming back so much shell-shocked from their experiences uh, in combat. Um, so it wasn't easy to keep all these people working together towards making uh, an atomic bomb. Um, I don't think Kitty helped very much. She had a close circle of friends. It's rumored that there, were, there was afternoon cocktails often uh, in, with, this, with this group of friends. And, uh, and so she didn't really um, help too much with, uh, with smoothing over some of the rough edges of living at Los Alamos during World War II. 
They had a couple of children, Peter and Tony. Uh, Tony was born in Los Alamos. Uh, Peter was born when when uh, Oppie and Kitty first got together in California. Um, so so they were raising children as uh, as they were doing uh, doing the, the the you know working on the Manhattan Project. Um, that must have been a bit a bit difficult in itself. Um, uh, Peter went on to become a carpenter and uh, lived in in, the, in northern New Mexico. Um, Tony was a gifted linguist like Api and uh, uh, was was going to get a job with the United Nations um, later on in life in the in the 60s or late 60s or early 70s and was denied a top secret security clearance for that work um, and and she had it just had a troubled. Um, relationship broke up uh, and eventually committed suicide. But last I heard, Peter was still alive. I just a little say that I met Peter a couple times when I was working at the museum in the 80s. And, and I told my story, like I told you last night, about my dad working with atomic weapons. And we were sitting at a lunch, and he never said who he, his dad was. I kind of opened the door thinking, if he wants to come in, we can talk about it. But he didn't. He actually left pretty quickly after I, I talked that, about that. Um, now, can you, we're going to move on to the Parsons house. So William Deke Parsons is a fascinating character. He was born and raised in New Mexico, but he was in the Navy. So this desert boy goes, goes on the seas. Um, he came uh, because of his expertise in ordnance to Los Alamos as a Navy officer with his family, with Martha and their two uh, teenage daughters. And, uh, and he became an associate director at Los Alamos. Um, now, he also was on the school board. And uh, when the initial plans for the school at Los Alamos was created, it was supposed to be a very kind of no frills, two-story, compact building. Uh, and Deke said, you know, my daughters are going there. I, 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 we need to have a little better facility. So then the central school became a kind of a bigger footprint, one-storied, uh, a little nicer building. And when Groves saw this building, he got angry because this wasn't, you know, it was a waste of money. And so, uh, and so he went over to, to Deke Parsons and he said, Parsons, you went against my orders. I'm going to have you for this. And Parsons supposedly later said, I, I didn't worry about that because he's Army and I'm Navy. And <laughs> there's not going to be any retribution for me. Um, uh, Martha kind of took up the slack from Kitty not really wanting to be a, a social director at Los Alamos. So she played hostess. Um, served as a hostess in, in some of the, the social gatherings. Um, and also then Deke Parsons went on to ride in the Enola Gay and armed the, uh, the, the little boy bomb that then dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. So he was, he was actually instrumental in, in delivering the atomic bomb to Japan. That's good. That's great. Um... So now we're moving on to um, Spruce Cottage. Um, so at that place, there was Trinity site Kenneth Bainbridge lived there and mathematician Dan Ulam. Uh, so um, the Ulam family lived at Spruce Cottage on Bathtub Row. And um, they were immigre scientists um, and, and his family. Uh, who had fled uh, the war in Europe. Um, and after the war, when the United States then realized that the Soviet Union had detonated their own atomic weapon in 1949, um, Ulam, well, the, the laboratory was given the task to come up with a, a more powerful bomb, which then became the hydrogen bomb, or known as the super back then. And Stanislaw Ulam was the scientist who had the key insight in how to trigger that bomb. And supposedly, he was standing at Spruce Cottage on a winter afternoon, looking out at the, the garden that, of course, was, was now gone because of the winter. And it's supposedly looking through the window at Spruce Cottage that he had the idea of how to trigger a thermonuclear device. I hadn't heard that one. Um, 
All right. So then we're moving down about the Barrow. We'll get to the Arts and Crafts building. So the Boys Ranch is interwoven a little bit with the Manhattan Project, not just with the existing structures there on the hill, but it's with some of the people who went there uh, as boys uh, and then came back. And Colonel Whitney Asbridge is one of them. Um, he went to the Boys Ranch School and then he came back and, and worked at, on the hill um, as a military officer. And so um, he, knew the, he knew both sides of, of Los Alamos and this wonderful uh, mountain uh, location with the Hamas right behind there and with, uh, with the deep valleys, with, uh, with the rich Native American heritage that's all around. Uh, people would go out on uh, weekends and go pot hunting and would find, would find pots and caves and would find Native American ruins all over the place in the, in the Pajarito Plateau. And, and he was one of those, those people that kind of knew both sides of the, of the plateau. Okay. Actually, it might be nice if you want to talk about how the Manhattan Project scientists and their families really loved the location and, and they spent their Sundays doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah, okay. Um, Los Alamos is, is, a, is a lovely, lo lovely physical location. Um, it's up at 7,000 feet. Uh, it's right up against the Hamas Mountains that go up to 12,000 feet. Um, there's, there's pine forests all over the place, uh, but it's also cut by very deep canyons. Um, because it's on the side of this old volcano that blew up a million years ago. Um, and so there's a lot of geology around there for anybody who's interested in geology. Uh, there's a lot of uh, nature around from hiking to skiing during the, during the winters. Um, uh, so there's a lot of outdoor activities that could be done. There's also a lot of Native American, not just in the existing pueblos down in the valley of San Ildefonso and Santa Clara, well, but, but in, in these deep canyons, there are ruins of, uh, of Native Americans that go back seven, eight hundred years. And so sometimes on weekends there would be these expeditions out to the, the various uh, uh, Native American ruins that were known at, at Sankaway and, uh, and Bandelier, which is part of our national parks uh, system. And so there were, there were these, um, these expeditions out for, for, for geology, for, for nature, for, uh, for ruins that, uh, that occupied people in the, in, the, in the times where they weren't working, which wasn't that often, but, but Sundays sometimes they, they had some time off and they would uh, avail themselves of these recreational opportunities. What do you tell your students about, you know, the history of nuclear weapons or this atomic age? I don't know, just trying to think about uh, its significance for today. Mm -hmm. Historians in the future will look back to the 20th century and see what happened in Los Alamos, and particularly what happened at Trinity with the detonation of the first atomic bomb as the most significant, or at least one of the most significant uh, uh, events of human history, at least in the 20th century. This is where the binding atom of, or the binding energy, this is where the binding energy of the atom is finally released and somewhat controlled by humans. So this new form of energy is released, this new form of destructive capability is released. Um, is, it's both a promise and a peril. Uh, the promise of energy, sometimes limitless. Uh, in the early atomic age, um, they said, well, we'll generate electricity from atomic energy. It'll be so cheap, you won't have an electric meter on your house. Um, so there was this promise of, of, a, of a future where energy was, was limitless and, and inexpensive, if not free. Um, there's also the peril of atomic weapons, which is, of course, the destruction of, of human history. Um, I call it Cleocide. Cleo is the muse of history. It uh, goes back to the ancient Greeks. We all, you know, all these different uh, occupations had muses. The muse of history was Cleo. And so I say that uh, atomic weapons uh, could bring about Cleocide, which is the death of, of human history. Um, scientists involved with the Manhattan Project knew this, um, and they said before Trinity, before the Manhattan Project, it was only God who could destroy the earth. After 
from the Manhattan Project and after Trinity, now humans had that ability. And perhaps that's why Oppenheimer, sometime after the Trinity explosion, said, I have become death destroyer of worlds, which goes back to a Hindu deity who is poised on a moment's notice to destroy Earth. And it's only through the devotion of his followers that this God doesn't destroy Earth. Well, now humans have that ability to destroy the Earth. Well, that's excellent. During the spring, mud was a constant bother at Los Alamos. Um, because it's at 7,000 feet, there were deep snows. When the snows melted, there was no paved roads. There were very few paved sidewalks. Um, so mud was a, was a constant worry. Um, so imagine this, that you had these Nobel Prize winners or future Nobel Prize winners stepping out of their ramshackle apartments in dinner wear and walking through this mud to go get to Fuller Lodge to maybe hear Otto Frisch play the piano. Um, and Otto Frisch was, was one of the two people who in 1938 realized that uh, the German physicists had split the atom in Berlin along with, with Lisa Meitner. Um, so, so there was this very kind of primitive feeling to this, wading through the mud in their fancy clothes, but then you know, going to this, uh, this event that was, that was a world-class pianist playing piano, who was also a, a, a talented, gifted physicist, or going to, to see a, a plays, so going to see a, a world-class pianist uh, like uh, Otto Frisch or, or also Edward Teller played the piano at the Fuller Lodge as well or, or also going for an evening of, uh, of light entertainment, uh, seeing a play with Arsenic and Old Lace where the first corpse that comes out of this play is Robert Oppenheimer and the other corpses are, are other key scientific personnel. Um, so so there's, this, there's this interesting... Uh, and, and they put up with it because it was for the war. They knew this was, uh, this was vital war work that was going on. Um, they knew that friends, family were dying overseas, that, that totalitarian regimes were trying to destroy uh, the democracies of the world. And so, and, and so they, they felt committed and, and dedicated to, uh, to doing their part in the war of, uh, of creating this, this weapon that would end. And granted, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a horrendous weapon that, that can kill tens of thousands of people. Um, but it, it was a weapon, perhaps, that was necessary to end the most horrendous war in human history, where tens of millions of people had died around the world. So the 509th Composite Group was the uh, wing of the Army Air Corps that was specifically created to deliver the atomic bombs to Japan. Uh, the atomic bombs were much, much bigger than conventional bombs, so they had to uh, modify uh, the bombers for, to, to be able to open up the bomb bay doors and drop one bomb, uh, and that was the whole payload. Um, they trained at Windover, Utah, uh, and they practiced um, dropping these, these, this one bomb, and the bombs weighed, mm, uh, what, about five tons, something like that. So the bombs were heavy, and as soon as the bomb dropped through the bomb bay doors, or the bomb bay, um, the plane jumped up because of the loss of weight. So, you know, the pilots had to, had to be aware of that. And also, as soon as the bomb dropped, the pilots then veered off and dove so that they would gain speed because they didn't want to be caught in the blast. So they would drop the bomb, and then they had this special maneuver that they did so that they wouldn't be, um, be destroyed by the blast that happened. I mean, they trained through, the, um, um, through the, the winter and spring of 1945 to do that, uh, and then were stationed at Tinian Island. I mean, Tinian Island is a small island. It became a big airfield uh, for the Army Air Corps to, uh, to launch their, their conventional weapons, the conventional bombs raids against Japan. Uh, so it was a big airfield, but at the very northern tip, it was a top secret part of that airfield. And that was where the 509th was. That's where they took off. There were no other bombers uh, that, that flew out of there. Um, 
And so when they took off, uh, they had a clear shot into uh, the, their targets in, in Japan. Uh, the targets, uh, they had a list of targets, and actually some of the cities of Japan weren't subject to the conventional bombing raids of the Army Air Corps. They were kept, you know, they were kept off the bombing list, the target list, because it was, um, we have this new powerful weapon, we're going to drop that on a bomb that hasn't been affected by conventional weapons to see what happens. Um, one of the targets was Kyoto, Japan. And that's the ancient capital of Japan. It was a sacred place uh, uh, for the Japanese. Uh, and, and Secretary Stimson took that off of the bombing list. He said, mm, I, I'm absolute on this one. Kyoto will not be bombed. And supposedly one of his reasons was that he thought after the war the United States was going to need Japan as a, one of our allies. And if we had destroyed their ancient capital, one of the most revered cities in, in their country, it would be a lot harder for the Japanese to then become our allies. So that ancient capital was, was not bombed. Can you talk about the, the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And so in the morning of August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay delivered a little boy bomb above Hiroshima. And it detonated, oh, what, 1,200 feet above, above the city. So it detonated high up. And that's so that the blast waves would come down, would spread out. They found that the Trinity, which is the Trinity explosion, which was only 100 feet above the desert floor, that the blast waves bounced back up into the atmosphere. So for full destructive power, they detonated the bomb high above the city. And the effects were devastating. Uh, the first thing that happened was this bright light. So this bright light uh, happened. If you were looking at the bomb, you would become blinded. It was so bright. Um, and then the blast waves spread out. So there was this thermal heat from the bright light. And then the blast waves spread out and knocked apart buildings. A lot of the buildings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the time were wood. So they were, they were uh, blown apart. And it, some of the buildings became shrapnel. Uh, so people who survived the, the, the bright light, the thermal heat, uh, maybe were impaled by something that came from the building that was blown apart. The buildings that were blown apart sometimes caught fire because people were cooking in them, and then the, the wood got caught from the, uh, from the fire, the cooking fires. Uh, they, they caught fire. Uh, some things caught fire because of the intense thermal heat. So uh, a firestorm waged, just raged through uh, the cities. Uh, and people who survived uh, the initial blast then got caught up in the, in the fires and died from that. People flocked to the, to the river running through Hiroshima and, uh, to try to get away from these firestorms that, that raged for, for days. Um, I heard a, a survivor who was a teenager at the time um, who uh, uh, lost her sight in the blast, and she was pretty far away from her home. Three days after the blast, her uncles finally found her in a school gymnasium that she had been carried to. She still couldn't see when they carried her back home, but she remembered the uncles talking about the fires that were still burning three days after the initial blast. Um, she eventually lost the, the, the ends of her fingers uh, through, the, you know, through the, the, the devastation of the atomic bomb blast. And, uh, um, and she had some reconstructive surgery, uh, but, but still she was, she was still, uh, had lost some of her fingers. Um, from the blast, um, people had their skin hanging off of them like loose clothes. So the blast would tear the skins apart. So people were walking around with their, with their skin trailing behind them. Um, so, so this is, uh, besides the radiation aspect of this, just the, just the thermal heat and the blast killed tens of thousands of people. Um, it's hard to get an exact count of how many people died. Maybe at Hiroshima, 60, 70,000 people died that day. Maybe another 60 or 70,000 people died within several months afterwards from radiation. Um, and this is in a city that was a quarter of a million at the time. 
Uh, Nagasaki, not as many people died, partly because it's a little hillier than Hiroshima, so that the blast waves kind of bounced off. So there was some protected pockets around Nagasaki that, uh, that didn't have the blast, the full effect of the blast of the, of the detonation. Um, radiation, there's a couple types of radiation. Um, there's a penetrating radiation that occurs around the time of a, of, a, of a nuclear blast. And this radiation penetrates through the body. Uh, it alters the DNA in your cells. Um, it um, it's kind of like gives your organs a, a, a sunburn, if, if you can say it like that. So, and it's such an intense burn that your organs start stop processing the vital fluids that, uh, that are needed to, to, to live. And so the body gradually shuts down. Um, a radiation, death through radiation can take maybe a month, and it's a very painful death. Um, the, the fortunate thing about that is those release of, of gamma rays that do this, um, they're, they're very short-lived. So that, that, that penetrating radiation is gone pretty quickly. But then what is left is something called lingering radiation. And that's something that can't even penetrate your skin. You put up a piece of paper, and those beta particles just fall off. So they can't, um, so they can't penetrate a, your skin. But if you somehow ingest them, if you have a wound and it gets in there, if you breathe in, if you eat something that has this radioactive fallout on it, then that's something that can cause health effects decades later and can, can cause death decades later. Uh, so, so there was, there's, those are the two types of radiation that were released, in addition to the thermal and the, and the blast waves, the shock waves that came from nuclear detonation. The, the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima um, that day in the headlines across the country was, uh, w was a story about how this one weapon was the equivalent of 2,000 fully loaded super fortress bombers. So this one bomb was the equivalent of, of, of 2,000 bombers carrying fully loaded, carrying conventional weapons. Sometimes the story of the Manhattan Project ends when the bomb bay doors over Hiroshima open. And, and then the effect of what happened in Hiroshima is, OK, it ended the war. Um, I, you know, one of the things I do in my lectures and my class, we go and look at what happened to the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and then knowing that that could happen in the United States. Well, here's another thing I'd like to say, that uh, the, the atomic bombs didn't, um, didn't win the war. The war was won by August of 1945. The war was won by the soldiers, the sailors, the, the people who flew the planes, uh, the, the Rosie the Riveters, the people who grew the crops that fed our soldiers and our ally soldiers and our allies' families. Um, it was won in the factories of the United States. It was, it, it was won by, by ourselves and our allies fighting these, these two totalitarian regimes. Um, the bombs ended the war in August of 1945. So the war was already won. It was just a matter of time of when Japanese would surrender. Uh, and so uh, the, the bombs um, just forced the Japanese to surrender then. Maybe the war would have ended in August through some type of surrender and negotiations. I don't know. Maybe it would have taken an invasion of the home islands of Japan to force Japan to surrender, which would have meant casualties on both the Allied side as well as the Japanese side. Uh, Perhaps millions of people's lives were saved by the atomic bombing of Japan. Because you can imagine Marines coming on shore in, uh, in Japan and facing uh, a reduced Japanese army, but also a lot of civilians who were then recruited to defend the beaches as well. Um, so, so perhaps as horrendous as a weapon that was unleashed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, it, it ended a war, the most horrendous war in, in the world, and actually saved lives, not just American lives, but Japanese lives as well. One thing that 
some people think is that if the United States had not developed a bomb, there wouldn't be an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Can you address? Uh, can you address that? And the, and the industrial nations all pursuing a yeah, parallel yeah, and so forth. Yeah. Would have there been an atomic bomb if the United States hadn't developed it through the Manhattan Project? That's a little tough to say. Um, it cost $2 billion in the early 1940s, the Manhattan Project did. Uh, would a nation not in war devote those kind of resources to, uh, to develop a, 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 an atomic weapon? Um, I don't know. It would have been a lot slower. Um, Maybe it would have just been the peaceful release of of, uh, uh, of nuclear energy for electricity. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a what if that's uh, that's hard to uh, to predict. Um, as a historian, I have a hard enough time predicting the past. It's hard to think of the what ifs and try to predict the future. That's great. Very good. Um, let's see. Well, we're now just in the territory that's uh, looking at the big issues. Yeah. Um, can you talk about um, I'm just thinking about Oppenheimer's address to the Los Alamos community as he was leaving yeah. in November yeah. of 45 and, yeah. and talking about how the world has changed. What did Oppie think of his role in creating an atomic weapon? Um, at the ceremony in October of 1945, as he was leaving the Hill, and, uh, uh, stepping away from being the director of the lab, and at the ceremony where the Los Alamos community was given the E Award, which is the highest award given by the U.S. government to a civilian entity, um, Oppenheimer said that uh, future generations might curse the name of Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project and Hiroshima if these weapons were added to arsenals of warring nations. Um, I think it's you as I had a, I think it was somewhat mixed about about what he had created. Um, later in life, he visited Japan, uh, and uh, um, in the 1960s. And he was talking to some Japanese journalists, and one of the journalists said, well, how do you feel about developing a weapon like the atomic bomb that was dropped on, on, on the Japanese? Do you feel bad about that? And he said, I don't feel worse about it today than I felt about it yesterday. What does that mean? It's, it's a, I mean, at, at times he spoke in, in kind of riddles in a way, and not kind of a riddle. Um, so I, I don't know how he felt about it, but I think he had some, some qualms about, about what he did. He worked after the Manhattan Project. He uh, was involved in trying to figure out how to, um, what kind of structure the U.S. government would create to manage atomic weapons. Um, and he, was, he worked with the Atomic Energy Commission until his top secret security clearance was yanked in 1954. Um, he, um, I, I think he, 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 and maybe this is me reading into him, but in the rush to develop an atomic weapon, I don't think many people thought what would happen if they succeeded. They were so focused on the mission and the task at hand, which was to create this weapon that would end the war. Thinking that maybe Germany was ahead of the, of, of, of the Allies. Maybe Germany would, would get an atomic bomb first. I mean, so I think that it, that's all. That all was part of the calculation as people rushed to, to create an atomic weapon. But then, and I think we see this throughout history, um, some invention happens, some discovery happens, and then people say, "Oh, now what are we going to do? How? What? What are we going to do with this?" Um, and so the consequences aren't something that people think about in the rush to actually do something. And it's only later that Oppenheimer said, oh, how are we going to make this not uh, something that 
uh, warring nations in the future will put in their arsenal. So he was a proponent of one world or none. Um, early on after the, after the end of the war, he was part of this in the 1940, late 1940s, this one, this world organization that would control and manage the mining of uranium, the production of plutonium, the creation of atomic bombs, and the use of atomic bombs. So it was going to be this one world organization that all the nations then uh, uh, agreed to. And if a nation then used an atomic weapon, uh, uh, a rogue nation, um, I mean, that, that nation would be obliterated. That nation would be then subject to, um, uh, to atomic bombing itself. Um, Maybe it's somewhat of a utopian idea, but, but I think he tried to struggle with what then to do with this, this weapon that he, uh, that he helped create. Uh, one of my mentors, Frank Saz, talked about the opening of Pandora's box. He said that atomic weapons were like the opening of Pandora's box. And coming out of Pandora's box or is plague and, and drought and... Uh, um, you know, all of these ills of the human condition. And then after all of these burst out of Pandora's box, the last thing that comes out is hope. And, uh, and I, think, uh, I, think, I think people hope that, that, that we won't use these again, uh, and warring nations won't use atomic weapons, uh, and that the promise of nuclear energy will eventually trump the peril of it. So after the end of World War II, um, and the United States had this, this powerful, powerful weapon, um, there was a lot of different roads that the country could take. Um, and one of them was this international control of, of atomic energy, one world or none. Um, maybe on the other side was just leave the military to control it. Um, there was something kind of in between there eventually, which was the creation of the Atomic Energy Commission, um, which then was a civilian uh, organization appointed by the president that then controlled all aspects of atomic energy, uh, but that had a military uh, committee, military subcommittee. It had a, a scientific uh, a subcommittee that Oppenheimer was, was part of. Um, and, and so that's the path that the country took. Um, and, and as the United States de detonated more atomic weapons in the tests in the South Pacific at Bikini and in Awitak, um, as the Soviet Union gained their weapon in 1949 and an arms race started, there were some people, Oppenheimer included, that thought maybe this is not the right road to be on. And so we come up to what I think is a fork in the road, which was 1952-1953. Oppenheimer started doubting whether the secrecy of our atomic weapons program was the right way to go. He thought it would subvert democracy. Um, and, and, and also he, he was just worried about um, uh, an arms race that would eventually destroy humanity. Um, he said in an article in the Foreign Affairs magazine, the, the periodical, the journal, that, um, that uh, the United States and the Soviet Union are like two scorpions in a bottle who will kill each other. Um, and so when he started saying maybe there's another path, maybe we've come to a fork in the road and we need to be more open with the American people about what happens when an atomic bomb goes off, and, and what kind of powerful weapons were developing, because by then the hydrogen bomb had been developed, which is a thousand times, or can be a thousand times more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and, and so he started to question whether we were on the right path. And I think because of that, he was then subjected to a, a what's called a personal security hear hearing. Uh, and his loyalty was doubted. Um, it was a combined effort by the FBI, possibly by the Air Force, because um, Oppenheimer didn't really support 
the creation of the Strategic Air Command and the delivery of atomic weapons. And he didn't support the development of the hydrogen bomb. He thought atomic bombs were powerful enough and that hydrogen bombs would actually divert defense dollars to the hydrogen program where it could have been best used elsewhere. Um, he had an enemy in the new head of the Atomic Energy Commission, a guy by the name of Louis Strauss, um, who it seems had some just petty personal complaints about Oppenheimer, how he kind of uh, embarrassed him in front of a congressional hearing uh, where uh, Strauss was act about, asked about uh, sending radioisotopes to foreign countries for medical research. And, um, and Oppenheimer was next and was asked the same thing and was asked if these isotopes could be used to make an atomic weapon. And Oppenheimer said, well, yeah, they could be used to make an atomic weapon. And in fact, you have to have a lot of things to make an atomic weapon. You have to have a laboratory, you have to have a shovel, you even have to have a bottle of beer. And all the congressmen laughed. And the aide to Oppenheimer who was watching Strauss just saw Strauss' face turn bright red. And, and so, um, so there was these various powerful people who decided to remove Oppenheimer for whatever reason uh, from, from his position as, uh, as this father of the atomic bomb, as a key member of the scientific committee for the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and so uh, the FBI commissioned a study of Oppenheimer, and in this study it said more likely than not Oppenheimer was, an atomic, was, a, was a Soviet spy. Um, and so from that report that was given by um, J. Edgar Hoover to President Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, whoa, if he's a spy, we have to seal him off. So they, they removed all top secret uh, documents from his Oppenheimer's office, and then uh, Strauss called Oppenheimer in at the end of 1953 and said, okay, so we're going to remove your top secret security clearance because of this report, and you have two options. You can either just go quietly and we won't say anything about it, or you can have a, a personal security hearing. And Oppenheimer left the office shook and went to his lawyer's office. And the FBI had already bugged his lawyer's office, thinking that would be where Oppenheimer would go after he received this news about, about this attack on his, on his, um, on his security and, and his integrity. Um, so they were bugging his lawyer's office from the very beginning. Um, he, the, through the January, February, March of 1953, 50, 54, excuse me, uh, through January, February, March 1954, um, uh, there were you know, uh, meetings with his lawyers that oftentimes the FBI listened to. Uh, the, uh, uh, the government uh, got its case together, hired a uh, a fairly aggressive prosecutor to take the case. And it was supposed to be a secret hearing. Um, all the witnesses were assured that their testimonies would be, would be secret. Um, uh, Oppenheimer's past did come up. Uh, partly his communist connections with his wife, his brother, sister-in-law, friends. Uh, but what really damned Oppenheimer the most was his own testimony. Uh, during the Manhattan Project, he had mentioned to a security officer at Los Alamos that there had been an approach by Soviet agent to some members of the Manhattan Project, um, and that, um, and and he just wanted to report that. And you can imagine the Army security officer in Los Alamos going, "Oh my goodness!" So they called him back in the office the next day, and they tape recorded, unbeknownst to Oppenheimer, his. Um, uh, what he was saying then. And Oppenheimer basically said, don't worry about it, you know, nothing happened, nobody gave any secrets, you know, there's nothing here there. There's nothing there here. Um, well, the army didn't let it go. They asked Oppenheimer to name names, and Oppenheimer said, I'd only name names if General Groves orders me to. A few months later, Groves did order him to name names, and, and he um, named the name of this chemist by the name of Elterton, uh, who was a Soviet conduit, um, and then who was approached. And Oppenheimer kind of went, well, it was, it was this guy by the name of Chevalier, 
who was one of his closest friends at the University of Berkeley. Was it Chevrolet? Who knows? I mean, this is one of the secrets of, uh, that, that atomic historians still puzzle over. Um, some, Greg Herkin, thinks that actually it was his brother that was approached. It was Oppenheimer's brother that was approached, um, and that Oppenheimer was protecting, shielding his brother. And so threw out this name that, that he just kind of threw his best friend under the bus. So that came, so that, that transcript of those conversations in 1943 were then used against him in 1954. So he would be asked something, and then the prosecutor would say, well, here in 1943, you said this. So it looked like Oppenheimer was lying to the board, the security, the, it's called the Gray Security Board after the head of it, Gordon Gray. So um, uh, this hearing went on for about a month. Different people testified. Um, Edward Teller maybe is the worst witness against Oppenheimer. And that goes back to some conflict they had in Los Alamos where Teller wanted to be head of the theoretical division and Oppie didn't appoint him that, he appointed Hans Bethe instead. And so, um, and so Teller said he would, he would feel better if the, uh, uh, about the security of the country uh, if, if atomic matters were in somebody else's hands besides Oppenheimer. I mean, that's, that's not that damning. But, that, but, so, but so the worst witness was really Oppenheimer himself, where he get, kept getting tripped up in what he said now, what he then was, was said in 1943. Uh, uh, in uh, the, the board security, uh, the, the gray board uh, voted to remove Oppenheimer's security clearance. It was given to the AEC. They voted to remove Oppenheimer's security clearance. And so his security clearance was, was removed the last day of June 1954. What's curious is that on July 1st, 1954, the very next day, Oppenheimer's contract had ended. It had ended the day, the last day of June. So if AEC really just didn't want Oppenheimer to have any access to top secret material, they would have not renewed his contract anyway. So for me, this was a fork in the road where one was a more open, transparent development of atomic energy, including weapons. And the other one was this more secret one, the arms race, that eventually led us to have over 30,000 nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union over 40,000 nuclear weapons, um, uh, an arms race that we could have easily blown each other up, especially during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, but but so, so Oppenheimer was, in a way, a sacrificial lamb to warn people in Los Alamos who were somewhat sympathetic to him for a lot of reasons, but, uh, but that you don't go down that road because this is what could happen to you. Um, in the Santa Fe, New Mexican, around this time, uh, an anonymous lab employee was, uh, was interviewed and he said, there but for the grace of God go I. So, so to me this was a fork in the road and, and it went then towards Teller's fork, which, was, which would eventually culminate with the uh, with the Strategic Defense Initiative and uh, the Star Wars. Uh, I could tell some more anecdotes of Los Alamos. Los Alamos is high up in the Jemez Mountains and gets a lot of snow. And there were a lot of people who, who skied from Europe, from the United States. And so uh, they built this, um, uh, this ski slope. Now, how do you clear the, the large evergreen trees from a ski slope? Well, they used some of the um, conventional explosives that they were using throughout the, the, the Pajarito Plateau in their, in their experiments of how to detonate uh, um, nuclear material. And so they strapped some of this around the tree trunks and blew it up. And the trees would fall and then they cleared. And that's how they created their first ski slope. Um, I was talking about this one time a few years ago where the current director, the then director of the labs was there and he was in the front row and I looked at him and I said, you don't do that now, sir. And he went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, great. What else? At a, 
at a place that um, works on weapons of mass destruction, it's, it's very interesting that there's a lot of people who belong to the Sierra Club up there who, um, who love the outdoors, who it's one of the reasons they stay in Los Alamos is because of its, of its location and, and uh, uh, opportunity to just very quickly go to some incredible um, wilderness. Uh, the Valle Grande, which is this caldera of a, of a volcano that erupted a million years ago that have elk in it and deer and, and bears and just be able to very quickly go, go up there and just hike through the, through the forests and, and, um, and kind of rejuvenate themselves from the work that they, that they do at the labs. Um, for children, it was uh, on one hand a great place to, to grow up. Uh, because they could quickly access uh, outdoor activities like that. But there was also a treacherous beauty to it because during the war, some of the Pajarito Plateau, there had been um, unexploded ordnance there. And kids not knowing exactly what it was would pick up something that was unexploded and bring it back and, and drop it off of their balcony and it would explode. So there's a treacherous beauty to Los Alamos, partly because it is such a, an incredibly beautiful place, but also it's, it's dotted both with this unexploded ordinance, and then also there was a, uh, a side canyon uh, that was nicknamed Acid Canyon. And from 1943 to 1952 or three, it was a place where untreated radioactive liquid waste was dis discharged into the side canyon. Uh, and so it was nicknamed Acid Canyon, hopefully to prevent young young kids from from going over there and playing. Um, and uh, and it was eventually uh, um, scraped down. Um, but I've read reports that said that even though they scraped the walls of that canyon quite a lot, um, there was still some residual plutonium left left in the, there. And uh, and this is after I climbed all through it, so. I went home and threw my shoes away. Mm. Can you, there's a lot of uh, concern by people who live in Santa Fe uh, and other, you know, in, in the valley, yeah, yeah. the around area yeah. valley, of, of what contamination might be coming their way or have already contaminated uh, the land and the groundwater and and yeah, such because yeah. of Los Alamos' activities. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a geologist nor a hydrologist, but I have heard that there are some contaminated flumes or contaminated flumes that are seeping underground, going down the canyons, the, the floor of the canyons, and that it would eventually take it to the Rio Grande. Whether those plumes have reached the Rio Grande, I don't know. But just from Acid Canyon itself, you would think that there would have been, um, for almost 10 years, um, just untreated radioactive waste that was would be released. Maybe it would dry. That sand then has, holds those contaminants. Uh, the summer thunderstorms that then cause some gully washers might wash it down, wash it down, wash it down eventually could get to, uh, to the Rio Grande. Um, there's also some worry because in the last 10 or 15 years, that part of the state has been hit by wildfires. And there's some stories, again, this is anecdotal. I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but some of the firefighters who worked uh, to try to curtail those, those forest fires, um, the, fa the side of their face that was facing the fire um, had some weird, almost chemical reaction from the side that wasn't facing the fire when they were working on it. So there's also some fears of people in the vicinity that when fires do happen, that there is some radioactivity that is then ignited or somehow carried up in the in the smoke from the uh, from the, the the Los Alamos area.